Hi there, Banggood has kindly provided this Fnersi LCR ST1 tweezer to me for review. I'm not paid for the video, but as I'm allowed to keep the unit, I mark it as a promotion. From previous reviews, you know that this doesn't stop me from sharing all my findings. If you are interested in getting an LCR ST1, I leave a link in the description below. The tweezers come in a nice and sturdy pouch. Inside is a manual. A short USB-C to USB-A cable. There seems to be just one of the spare tweezer tips. Hmm. But there is a spare metal plate with an adhesive film that allows the tweezers that have a magnet inside to stick to a workbench. Ah, there's the missing tip. These tips are angled down which allow a more comfortable hand position when doing lots of PCB testing. The standard tips mounted on the tweezers are straight. Nice to have a choice and be able to change the tips. At power up, the ST1 always defaults to this display, which is very bright and easy readable. The camera doesn't do it justice. The mode is auto, in which the ST1 automatically switches between capacitance, resistance or inductance, depending on what it sees on the tips. The test voltage is 0.6 volts and the frequency 1 kHz. At the bottom it shows the serial resistance RS and the dissipation factor D. The menu brings up a couple of options that are usually set once and then left alone. You cycle through them using the jog switch on the top and confirm by pressing the jog switch down. It's very easy to use. You can select between English or Chinese as language. Adjust the beep volume in 5 increments, 1 is lowest. Backlight intensity, this is full intensity but I tuned it down a little afterwards. If the unit should turn itself off after some period of inactivity, in the moment this is off, Restore allows you to reset the unit to factory settings losing all your adjustments. About tells you the firmware version which is 1.5 in my unit. Since there is a 1.6 available on Fnersi's website, the first job is to do a firmware upgrade. The version 1.6 file I downloaded from Fnersi's website contains a file called update log listing firmware versions and what was changed in each. This is great and much appreciated. So few manufacturers do that. Anyway, it seems there is no new function in 1.6, just a fix of some reset bug. Still better get that firmware in my unit updated. To get into the firmware upgrade mode, you have to press down and hold the jog switch on the top while powering up. A bootloader OK appears but disappears immediately when I let go of the switches. Let's try that again, but this time holding the switch longer. No luck. Let's try again but pressing some buttons and that did the trick. The bootloader stays on and I can connect the USB cable to the PC. I think it expects a second press of either the power menu or the jog wheel to confirm that you really want the bootloader. I can't say which one did the trick since I tried all three. Here is what the manual has to say on the firmware upgrade. Not a lot. The first bullet is definitely more complicated than what's written here. Let's see how the remainder goes. Although they recommend Windows of course, I'm using a Linux machine here, Unix Linux Mint. A folder pops up with a ready.txt file in it. No point in opening since it has zero bytes. The file name serves as a message that the unit is ready to receive the new firmware. According to the instructions, I need to drop the extracted firmware binary into this folder. There you go. On the device, the bootloader springs into action. This goes very fast and I'm glad I managed to capture it. There, all done and the device reboots. The folder on the PC disappears. Let's see if it was successful by going into the menu and all the way to the about setting. Yes, it now says version 1.6 and I'm all done. This was a rather painless process. With 1.6 running, let's explore further. Moving the jog switch cycles between auto and the manual modes. Diet, inductance, capacitance, resistance and back to auto. 
Pressing the jog switch allows you to select the voltage setting and then toggle between 0.6 and 0.3 volts. Pressing it again selects frequency and toggles between 1K, 10K and 100 Hz. I already knew that you can change the readout at the bottom right. The pictures in the manual show the ST1 with a Q instead of a D. But how to do this is not at all in the online manual. I said online manual because I discovered that the printed manual that came with the unit contains that information. The trick is to do a long press of the jog switch which now allows you to select Q, the quality factor which is the reciprocal of the dissipation D. Higher Q or lower D means better, less lossy component. D is generally used more for capacitors and Q more for inductors. Next option is Z to see the impedance, in which case RS is not really needed, and X which is the imaginary part of the real part shown in RS on the complex plane. In nearly all cases you will probably only look at the big number showing the capacitance, inductance and resistance and RS to see ESR, but it's very nice that for special cases the ST1 allows you to see the other parameters if needed. Another thing not mentioned in the manual is calibration. If you push and hold the jog switch left during power up you get an additional calibrate menu, allowing you to do your own calibration. The first step is to shorten the probes. I have not gone any further but I believe you need to connect certain reference resistor values like 1 ohm, 10 ohms, 100 ohms and so on when prompted to do so. It would be nice if Nursey would add the necessary steps in the manual so one can prepare properly. An easily overlooked feature is that the LCR ST1 can do recording. Every time you press the hold slash menu key the ST1 adds a record to a history file which you can access through the USB interface. It stores all measurement parameters there not just what's currently selected on display. This is a nice feature and potentially very useful. My only complaint is that this record is continuously growing with every press of the hold slash menu key. I tried deleting, renaming and using factory reset but all in vain. The old values are still there. The only way I found to reset the history to zero is to reload the 1.6 firmware with a bootloader but obviously this is a rather ridiculous solution. The ST1 uses a nice sine wave to test the components. Here is the 1K signal at 0.6 volts. The 0.6 volts is the RMS value so the peak to peak value is about 1.7 and the amplitude half of that or 850 millivolts. The TM3A I recently restored shows the 0.6 volts as 6 on the upper scale in the 1.5 volt range. At 0.3 volts the values are halved meaning the amplitude is now about 425 millivolts. This low value should pretty much ensure that you can measure in circuit without transistors and most diodes turning on and influencing the result. The low voltage affects of course the diode mode which is an odd thing to have in an LCR meter for in circuit measurements when the whole idea is to use test voltages too low to turn on diode and transistor junctions. With 0.3 volts you can just about measure germanium or Schottky diodes. I like how the ST1 solved the problem that the tweezer probes are of course not polarized. We are testing with AC, remember? The symbol on the display shows the direction of the diode. That's very neat. But normal diodes like the 1N4148 or 1N4007 do not respond at that voltage which is expected. With 0.6 volts selected, they do but at that voltage other things on a PCB also do to make in circuit measurements potentially inaccurate. And speaking of accuracy, how accurate is the LCR ST1 anyway? To find out this needs reference standards like those with known inductance, capacitance or resistance values and their tolerances and a bunch of inductance decays, capacitance decays and resistance decays and LCR meters to compare against like a Tenma 72-10465 which is really a rebadged Unity UT612. The Peak Electronics is R70 but this one tests not using sine waves and it's only for capacitors greater than 1 microfarad. 
and the AIM LCR data bridge 41, which uses sine waves and supports 100 Hz or 1 kHz frequency. For this one, I don't have the add on adapter for Kelvin probes, so I'm improvising for now, which works but hurts accuracy in the low ohms and cap ranges. I do have other LCR bridges, but since I have to make a couple of hundreds measurements for this test, they are too inconvenient and slow. I use the LCR ST1 with these leads attached. Of course, these have a resistance and add some stray capacitance. For accuracy results, this has to be nulled out. To null the resistance, you need to shorten the leads, which reads in the order of 200 milliohm. To null, you use a short press on the power on key. The reading fluctuates a bit, so the best is about 2 milliohms, not truly zero. Then I can use the leads to test my reference standards and decades, recording each measurement in a spreadsheet. I'm showing this here in an accelerated example, not the actual measurements, which are much slower. Exactly the same procedure has to be used for capacitance, but with open leads. The ST1 now reads about 2.6 picofarad. After a short press of the power button, it's now 0.2 picofarad. This null function is maybe not that important for normal use of the ST1, since one would most likely just want to know a ballpark number, like is this cap or resistor good or not, but it's great to have it for more accurate measurements. And rather than bore you with showing hundreds of measurements, here are the results. This is a chart comparing the error in percent of the ST1 against my two main LCR meters, the UT612-10 ma using red dots and the AIM LCR401 using blue dots. These tests were done at 1 kHz on all devices for capacitors up to 10 microfarads and with 100 Hz for larger capacitors. At the bottom you see the ST1 capacitance accuracy spec for reference. The first observation from this is that the blue and red dots are reasonably close together, which means the ST1 agrees more or less in equal amounts with both of my other meters and that these meters in turn agree with each other. Secondly, the error of the ST1 is pretty much just 1% for a wide range, which is excellent. Only at the higher end do we see a slight increase. This chart shows the ESR values measured by the 4 meters for capacitors from 1 microfarad onwards. They are in reasonable agreement except for the ESR70, which is probably because of its very different measurement method. Moving on to inductance and from 1 millihenry onwards to 1 henry, we have again a nice clustering of red and blue dots around the 1 to 2% error level, so no issues there. Below the 1 1 millihenry mark, there is more variation in the result. As usual, the percent error calculation amplifies the difference artificially the lower the value gets. In reality, these results are not bad if you compare the actual values. This is a section of the spreadsheet and if you compare the numerical inductance values that appear divergent in the previous graph, you can see they are actually still pretty close in practical terms. Of note, the 401 readout was unstable when trying to measure a 1 microhenry inductor at 1 kHz, the maximum frequency it supports. So I did not use the 401 for this value. For the ST1 and the UT612, I switched the frequency to 10 kHz for this value as the ST1 needs that for measuring as low as 1 microhenry. For the serial resistance in inductors, all 3 meters are basically in close agreement over the complete range, except for the 1 microhenry value that I could not properly measure with the 401 as I just mentioned. And lastly, resistance. In this case, I choose my Agilent 3441A as a reference, although this was using DC and 4 wire mode. You will notice that I use less samples above 10 kilo ohms simply to speed up the test. All values lie nicely in the plus minus 1% difference band, again an excellent result for the ST1. My conclusion is that the LCR ST1 meets its specs and despite the tiny size is a very capable LCR meter. Finally, some practical tests. It has of course no problem in measuring a good capacitor. But what of a slightly bulging 220 microfarad 35 volt cap that causes the backlight of a PC monitor to fail? 
In auto mode it's picked up as a resistor and that's pretty telling already. So let's switch to capacitor mode. Not even 70 microfarad and an ESR of 25.4 ohms. Yes, this is definitely a bad capacitor. Lastly, the most common use of the ST1 is probably checking PC components in circuit. This works fine, but the tips probably need a bit of sharpening for really small components. No problem, I can do that myself. Also note that the display cannot be rotated, which means it's upside down if using your left hand. I hope a firmware update will fix that and hopefully also add a more convenient method to reset the history file. Apart from these hopefully temporary issues, the LCR ST1 is a very capable LCR meter with a easy to read display and a good battery life. It has certainly earned a permanent place on my workbench. If you enjoy my videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. There are many more projects, repairs and reviews coming up and it would be great if you decided supporting this channel by becoming a Patreon. Thanks for watching.